so tonight we're going to talk about um, basically egg cases and egg case recovery and identification of egg cases. So our session this evening is all about cats, hounds and mermaids. An interesting name as you may think. So a guide to egg cases of skates and sharks found around Malta. So <clears throat> we often refer to egg cases as mermaid purses, but what do we mean? What's, you know, what's the detail behind it? So when we think about shark and skate egg cases, actually 40% of all sharks and all species of skates reproduce using a method referred to as oviparity, basically meaning they lay eggs. The eggs they lay are often called mermaid purses. Their shape looks a little bit like a purse with the tendrils below the horns looking like handles. Each species has a unique design of egg case, which means it is possible to identify the species by finding the egg case. So if it's washed up on the beach, or we can see it in the sea, we can actually identify each individual species individually just by the shape of the egg case. So what are our egg cases? All shark and skate egg cases are actually made out of the fibrous protein known as collagen, the same which creates our hair, which forms a tough leathery pouch and the pouch protects the embryo as it develops inside the egg case. Almost all egg cases contain a single egg, although there are actually several species which contain more than one. Some of these are Raya pulcher, the mottled skate, and Raya binocular, the big skate, which can actually produce multiple embryos inside an egg case. The maximum number has been, has been recorded seven. The structure of the egg case for a skate, <clears throat> as, the, as the image shows, is the basic capsule, and then we can identify individual areas of the capsule based on the, the features. So we have a keel, the lateral keel, the horn, the proximal horn, the distal horn, the distal field, and the proximal field. And here you can see on the right-hand side of the slide a number of different descriptive uh, details which can be used to identify the individual egg cases. And because each individual skate egg case can be identified because of differing fields, these facts are quite important. And after the presentation, um, probably in the next day or two, all this information with it, along with the slides will be available to be able to be downloaded. And then you can look in more detail at these individual um, text. Here we have the basic structure of a shark egg case. So unlike a skate, skate egg case, there are no horns. There are tendrils. And the tendrils are long fibrous strands, which are used to entangle and hold the capsule in place while the shark is developing inside. They're quite different in shape. From an egg case search back in 2012, <clears throat> Egg cases can be found anywhere. They can be found on the beach. They can be found nestled amongst rocks. Basically, wherever they become entangled and trapped. But why do we search for egg cases? Why are egg cases important to look for? Firstly, egg cases not only take you to places around the islands that may not normally venture to, but there's also the opportunity to discover something new about sharks and skates. Perhaps can identify areas where they breed. If we can actually find a large number of the same species in one particular area, it's a good indicator or potentially a good indicator that breeding areas or nursery areas are within the proximity of where the egg cases have been washed upon. If we can identify nursery and breeding areas, actually, as an organization, we're in a better position to have these areas protected, but we need evidence. And finding egg cases washed up on the beach in large numbers would be a good way of taking this towards this. At the moment, we don't know if there are specific locations of breeding and nursery areas around the Maltese Islands. Unlike the UK, where egg cases are laid in very shallow water because of the temperature, <clears throat> around Malta, we don't know, because generally speaking, egg cases are laid into a depth of water 40, 50, 60 metres and be 
beyond. Now we have encountered egg cases and we have records of egg cases around our shoreline. However, these generally are beyond normal dive wall limits, normal recreational limits. So we really don't know where to put our finger to point to potential breeding in this area. This is still a work in progress. So how do we find out about egg cases? There are a few different techniques that we can use. Firstly, we need to understand where and how we might find them. So first, we can find them all year round. There's actually different species with eggs that leave and uh, deposit eggs around the island at different times of the year. Normally, springtime in most places is a peak. We found so far the most common time to find the egg cases is after strong winds and currents hit the islands, generally between November and May. However, as the climate changes, and winds and temperatures and currents change, we can often find them through all times of the year in increasing numbers and in different places. What we've shown and what we've found over the last number of years is that there are basically four different types of identifying egg cases over the last four years, not over the last four years, over the last, um, over the last number of years, four different techniques. Firstly, the lucky find. This is where you're basically out and about. You go for a coffee, you go for ice cream, and you take a stroll on the beach. And you know what to look for. You're looking for an egg case. You're not really sure. So it's a lucky find. You walk along and all of a sudden, ding, you find an egg case. This is a very simple technique of finding egg cases. I've been to Bahar Chak on several occasions and when sitting down for a coffee on the set, I actually have encountered an egg case just sitting on the sand next to my feet. A lucky find. Here we have examples of other egg cases laying in the sand that were lucky finds. Identified on the right with a stick, Christina in the centre looking at the edge, she can see the egg case. So, a lucky find is when we basically encounter an egg case without uh, a direct or purposeful search. It's more random. The second technique is to actually do a timed or a specific stretch length of walk along the coastline or up to the beach. Now in Malta, most of our beaches and our coastline is relatively small. So a timed search is not so obvious. If you're in the UK or on the coastline of France or Sicily, where the beaches can stretch for several kilometers, it would not be so practical to walk for three, four, five kilometers just to look for an egg case without a particular pattern or a particular technique. And the technique here is to basically allow a duration of time so you can cover one area in one direction and you can repeat it in another direction to the same time. And again, <clears throat> through this method, you can often encounter many different types of egg cases, skate egg cases, shark egg cases, as the pictures show. The third technique <clears throat> is one of the most popular techniques which are used in many countries around the world. And this is where we basically search along the strand line. Now, a strand line is where debris from the sea is stranded, hence the name strand. And strand lines are the lines of debris formed by incoming, wide, by incoming waves or tides, by wind or by movement of water, and often egg cases become caught up in the debris and then lay on the beach awaiting to be discovered. So here we have an example of a strand line down at Antipia, where there's a distinct amount of Posidonia and seagrass laid, laid upon the sand. And within this is a good area to search for egg cases. And through these searches, we've often encountered many, many different types of egg cases, shark egg cases and skate egg cases, as the picture shows. The final technique is to search along the back of the beach or the edge of the coastline. Now, as egg cases are drying under the sun, they become light and the wind often blows them right to the back. In fairness, 
This has been the most successful area during all searches since 2008 onwards. Although we follow the searches along the strand line, where egg cases are starting to go through the drying process, by far the most popular place of egg case is to be, to be deposited. It's right at the very back of the beach. Here you can see in the picture a number of different egg cases. Claudia holding an egg case she found, a search and iron to see her, a skate egg case, and a shark egg case, which are washed up right towards the back of the beach. Sadly, these egg cases often end up lying upon many pieces of plastic, which is another consequence of things drying and moving towards the back of the beach. Again, more examples of skate egg cases and shark egg cases that were found identified as they blew towards the back of the beach. Sometimes when the egg cases go to the back of the beach, they become dried and crispy, and they often become very um, deformed. And it's often very difficult to identify exactly which species the egg case belongs to. Bearing in mind that egg cases are very specific in their shape and their design with heels and horns, tendrils or no tendrils, based upon the individual species that lay the egg. Now, as they dry, they shrink and they contract. And this makes it very difficult. So there is a very simple method in order to be able to rehydrate the egg case and identify accurately the egg case that has been found on the beach. So to rehydrate them makes them much easier to identify. And they will expand naturally back to their true size. And it's a very simple method. You simply fill a container with fresh water, put the egg case in the water, ideally removing air so it sinks, and leave it to soak for one to two hours, or longer if needed. And when you remove the egg case from the water, after a long time, you'll find it's become fully hydrated. At this point, it should go back to its original state. And depending on damage, you should be able to clearly identify the egg case. Of course, once you've identified, photograph, you can simply dry them out as well in a very well ventilated spot. If they're empty, there should be no smell. If there is debris of an embryo or anything that may have got into it during its time in the sea, through rinsing, you can clean it and then again air dry and you will have a perfectly preserved egg case. Now, not all egg cases and egg case discovery happens on the beach. This is by far the most common way of identifying egg cases, but sometimes you're very lucky and lucky enough to actually identify egg cases in the sea. Now, over the years of looking for egg cases around Malta, what we found is that we found egg cases in small spotted cat sharks and starry, starry skates, snowback rays. And we took this information and tried to see if we could find within shallow waters the presence of egg cases through you know, identifying nursery areas and breeding areas. Well, actually, we didn't. What we found is that through the collection of egg cases from the fish market and the development through that of the recovery and release program, we identified that egg cases need to be developing within certain temperature ranges. And around Malta, those areas need to be below 22 degrees, which basically puts them at 20 to 40 to 50 to 60 meters depth of water in order to maintain that temperature range throughout their developing cycle. So searching for egg cases underwater is quite difficult. It also requires a lot of skill and patience. If a potential area, nursery area is being identified, it's down to good observational skills. Egg cases are designed to blend into the environment. They're concealed through camouflage. The coloration of the egg cases and the capsules makes them often very difficult to see. If they're found underwater, there's a good chance that there may be a developing embryo inside. So in order to check this, we need to be very careful. We should never try to attempt to move or disturb the egg case 
because of the developing embryo. However, what we can do is use a technique which is referred to as candling or illuminating the egg case with a strong light. Here we have an example of that. So these images were taken off Gozo in 2017 by a diver Fritz Brugge. And these are nurse hand egg cases. And he encountered a small bunch of egg cases at depth around the 60 to 65 meters. And through handling, he could observe the embryo, or at least the embryonic um, capsule, was intact within the egg cases. What happened to these sharks as they developed, we don't know. But to see the shark egg case naturally deposited on the seafloor is very positive. If we look at the lower image at the bottom, what we'll actually see is the egg cases, although it's good to see, were deposited on what appears to be described as fishing line. Fishing line, in turn, over time, can entangle marine life. So although it wasn't a natural place for the depositing of the egg case, it seemed a suitable location for the nurse house in this case. In time, hopefully, through removal of net, sharks can rely upon laying eggs on natural seagrass and sea deposits in order for the eggs to be safe as they develop. So here we have an example of differences between skate and shark egg cases. The biggest difference between a skate egg case and a shark egg case is in shape and how they work. The skate egg case on the right has a large capsule with four horns. Each of the horns is a tube with an opening. However, during the early stages of development, the tube opening is closed. Therefore, as the skate egg is deposited and sealed, the skate egg is completely concealed within a gelatinous liquid until stages in the development after three to four months allow the gelatinous liquid to slowly dissolve, allowing seawater in, increasing the oxygen and the oxygen required for the skate to develop to increase. Once this happens, the skate starts to develop rapidly with increased oxygen levels. In the same way, the shark egg case has a capsule, and the central section of the capsule is where the egg is initially suspended in a gelatinous liquid. The upper portion with the horns, which are enclosed with the tendrils protruding, and the lower area with a flattened area, which is sealed, which is where the shark will ultimately hatch, are concealed and closed again with a gelatinous liquid. And again, after approximately three to four months of development, the gelatinous liquid is dissolved, absorbed as an additional nutrient, and this additional nutrient allows the shark to grow. And as it takes the position to the bottom to hatch, it will protrude from the bottom and slowly push its weight out and hatch after anywhere between six to 12 months. The shape is the biggest difference. Although we often refer to shark eggs and skate eggs as mermaid purses, truly the skate egg has more of a purse-like shape. However, shark eggs are also referred to as mermaid purses because of the handle, which appears at the top where the tendrils fall. In Malta, we have multiple species of skates, 17 in total, and three species of sharks who develop through oviparity by laying eggs. Here are some examples of the different skate eggs that could be and can be encountered washed up upon our beaches. We have the cuckoo ray, a relatively small species of skate, spotted ray, thornback ray, starry ray, 
the blue skate, long nose skate, brown ray, and bottle nose skate. The rough ray, the Maltese ray, and the black mouth cat shark. The small spotted cat shark and the nurse sound or bullhook, as it's known in the UK. As you can see, these different egg cases differ individually, either by the shape and length of form, the shape of the capsule, or in the case of shark eggs, a capsule with horns and tendrils. When they're washed upon the beach, they're individually recognizable. If you can identify a large presence of egg cases washed upon the beach, we in turn can start to investigate the potential areas of nursery grounds or breeding areas. Now, as I said previously, what we found is that shark egg cases and even many skate egg cases are not laid within our shallow coastal waters, primarily because of the temperature. Temperature is a very important factor in the development of shark and skate egg cases. And knowing through the shark development program that we have running, 22 degrees appears to be a maximum before shark egg cases cease to develop. Bearing this in mind, it's fair to say that probably shark and skate species maintain a temperature range probably between 16 to 18 degrees, if not below, as a maximum within the Mediterranean waters around Malta. If these temperatures increase, then the probability is the embryos will cease to develop. By finding shark and skater cases along our beaches, they do give us a real insight into population or population dynamics. Do we really have skates developing and breeding in our coastal waters? Possibly not our immediate coastal waters. However, in our deeper waters, within several kilometers on the shore, it's quite possible that we have skate and shark egg cases developing. Nursery areas. There have been several projects developed over the last number of years through the Life Il Baha and other projects which have been funded through the Life Program programs of the European Union, looking at different types of marine environments, caves, sands, deep water, etc. And this data has shown that often egg cases have been caught or, or entangled in trawling gears through trawling survey, or also seen during these deep water surveys developing. However, what we don't know is whether these are true nursery areas or just one off areas where, where shark and skate eggs have been deposited. Now, we, what we hope to do over time is develop a new ID guide based on the images which are currently available through the Shark Lab Malta website. Um, and the new ID guide will be available as a PDF or a leaflet, which will be able to be downloaded soon. What we're also looking to do is develop an app so that people out and about on the beach, if they encounter an egg case, can actually go to the app and identify the egg case through the app and register which species they believe it the egg cases from. Now, this is following on from a program and a project which started back in the UK back in 2003. And in 2003, the Shark Trust, which is a, a, a partner organization of Shark Lab Malta and a collaborative organization of the European Latin Branch Association, created a project called the Great Egg Case Trust. And the great egg case hunt was basically about citizen science, infusing and inviting people to go out and about on their beaches, which they often did anyway, but not only to go out and enjoy the pleasure of a new location, but also to enjoy searching for interesting things such as shark and skate egg cases. 
And to date, the Shark Trust has collated information from over 100,000 people during its uh, during the program the program's uh, running time. And Shark Lab Malta will be joining the Great Egg Ace Hunt and collaborating our data with their data. So if you want to know more about the Shark Trust and what their egg case search is designed to do in the Citizen Science Project, is designed to do, you can go to the Shark Lab, sorry, the, the Shark Trust website. There are links at the end of this presentation. So you can go for a search and you can see what the Shark Trust is also doing. We have been doing it since 2008. So five years later, we started to replicate a similar program. We soon will be joining up and teaming up with the Shark Trust and adding our egg case data to their egg case data to increase a better knowledge of shark and get egg case deposits on seashores and coastlines around Europe. At this point, I want to thank you for attending the session, but does anybody have any questions? If you do, please feel free to unmute and ask a question. anybody have a question? Um, yeah, great. I'll go for one. Um, do you know how um, Life Behalf found the eight cases? Is it mainly through their survey, like in-person surveys, or is it more through their like video ROV stuff? Actually, it's a mix of Charlie. Uh, thanks for the question. So, I mean, Surveys underwater um, <clears throat> are, are a few and far between around Malta. Uh, they happen in many different places, but a case development is is a very limited um, research tool in water. So, so the information that we have in relation to egg cases and egg case deposits are generally beach related, where egg cases have been washed up on the beach. Or alternatively, the few and far between videos which dives have taken usually at depth beyond 50 meters. Cheers, thank you. No problem, Johnny, thank you. Any other questions? Greg, is it worth you or Kayleen talking about the um, a case recovery program? That, I mean, that would be, a, yeah, that would maybe be the natural. Sh maybe stop sharing yeah. screen as well. Um, yeah, yeah. absolutely, the natural follow-on, so. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, the natural follow-on is essentially, we, we started off back in 2008. And one of the first activities that we did as Shark Lab we start to look for egg cases washed upon the beach. And later on, in 2011, after three and a half or so years of gathering data from the fish market, we encountered an egg case protruding from a shark. Except there was a big difference. This particular egg case actually had an embryo inside. This was an egg case protruding from a shark that had been recently landed by fishermen. And it raised a question, actually it raised many questions, but the first question was, what could we possibly do with this egg? Is it going to develop? Could it develop? Is it possible? Question is question. We took the egg, we placed it in a small aquarium, and we waited, and we watched. And actually, to our belief, to our you know, disbelief, it started to develop. And it developed for several months to the point where there was a small embryo sitting on top of an egg and it was moving, 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 moving. And sadly it died. But during that time we started to collect other eggs and it came, kept on coming this idea, this idea, 
could it be possible that we could take an egg from a dead shark and give it the right conditions to develop? And ultimately, could we put it back in the sea? Put it back where it belongs? Would it be possible? And actually, yes, it was. And it is. And it has been. And we've been very successfully since that point recovering eggs proactively as many of the people who are attending tonight know. We collect eggs from dead sharks. Mind-blowing. We take eggs from dead pigs. Mind-blowing. We're taking things from an animal which is dead, but within it is the potential of life. And encapsulated within this protective collagen case is the potential of life, something which would normally be discarded back in the sea into the bin and we took the eggs and we placed them in an environment as close to the sea as possible we succeeded in 2013 we put our first little baby shark seven and a half to eight centimeters long back in the sea over the last number of years 315 sharks have been released back into the sea through the dedication of members of Shark Club, taking eggs from dead sharks through the research and the gaining of information through the fish market. And we've been able to make a big difference. Not only that, we've also been able to inspire other organizations, Association Lama in Spain, Cayenne Association in Tenerife, are following suit because they have also have opportunities to recover egg cases from fishing vessels or from the markets. And they have eggs that would normally be thrown away. Except they're not thrown away completely. They're taken, they're placed into an environment which is trying to support their development and growth. They too are successfully now releasing sharks. All of this is not possible without each and every one of you as a supporter, as a member, as an intern. So finding an egg case on a beach is a start point. Often, it simply creates a degree or an element of interest. It simply sometimes makes people start to think, what is that thing on the floor? They find out. It's an egg. Shark. Shark. Shark legs. Is it possible? Because I only know about big sharks. How can a shark lay an egg when it's so small? And they start to get interested. They start to get intrigued. If they're in Malta, they have the, you know, they have the, um, the opportunity to come to one of our events where we can show them egg cases from skates and sharks and we can give them information about these amazing and beautifully diverse creatures from small to large and the program that we have working with multinational aquarium supported with multi aqua you know and the development of not only taking a shark egg from a dead shark and allowing it to develop but also tagging it, in the case of the nurse hounds, with the hope that in the future we'll gather some more information, hopefully in the distant future. Because we really don't know what happens on the release. Do they survive? Do they die? We don't know. Many questions. But the biggest thing that we can take comfort from is that each and every shark, egg, or skate egg that we take and allow to develop and ultimately caringly release into the sea has a chance. It has a chance it would have never had had it not encountered shark lab molten. And we can hope that they will live long and ultimately reach maturity 
where they too can reproduce and create a new generation. But hopefully, we won't encounter the fish market. So it's a very interesting picture. Since 2008, when the Shark La Malta really started, the first activity we ever did was trying to find egg cases on the beach, being citizen science. Citizen science and citizen scientists trying to explore our environment, trying to explore what was around us. And in 2008, we started looking for dried washed up egg cases. In 2011, we encountered the first egg case protruding from a shark. In 2013, we released our first shark back in the sea. In 2020, we released our 315 shark. In 2021, we will be releasing more. And we will still be in our whole process of things, looking for the washed up egg cases with the hope of finding nursery areas and breeding areas of these precious species that we've become very passionate about and we love. Sharks are things and species which people are starting to learn about. Unfortunately, skates tend to be overlooked. In Maltese hamina, a generic term for a winged fish. They're caught, they're landed in numbers which are obviously having a detriment on their populations. So as an organization which has its name Shark Lab, ultimately, we really are starting to focus on the bigger picture of sharks, skates, and rays. And skates are the next target focus. Rachel, the scientific officer, is starting to work with some of our interns, as you will know, on a more proactive collection process of skate eggs through fish shops. So bringing in different skate stakeholders different people who encounter skates. Because at the fish market, we can't find eggs in skates. Anatomically, they're complex. They're anatomically more complicated than a shark to detect an egg. So we have to think outside the box. And the box is, where are they bought? Where are they sold? Where are they processed? And here is a new opportunity to collect egg cases proactively with the hope of ultimately finding the right conditions and allowing them to develop and ultimately releasing them back into the sea. And each and every person here this evening is a part of that support network, that supporting process. So for me personally, thank you for that. We're not a static organization. We started with an idea and we're continuing to drive the idea further forward about how we can make a difference. Making a difference can be a simple conversation or it could be a hands-on experience that each and every person who is interested can make that difference. And for that, thank you. You're here, you're interested, you want to know more. And we as an organization want to share what we know with you so you too can go away and make a difference. And again, I open, I open the session to any questions. So please feel free to ask any questions about the sharks or the skates, the recovery program, or even anything in general. We have time. And if any of the other members, members of the organization also want to join into a conversation, then please, please feel free to unmute and and you know, take part. It's not all about me. It's about the organization as a collective organization. Sorry, Basil, I'll jump in quickly. Um, Greg, do you find that it's more difficult um, for the release program to get skate or ray eggs to hatch to maturity? Is it or is it sharks that just seem to be the more consistent um, kind of developing? 
in artificial conditions. Okay, it's, it's an interesting question, Charlie. And actually, what we found is that <clears throat> in total, we have had 11 skates, some back rows, um, develop and hatch over the last number of years. However, with the exception of one, um, they only lasted a match of weeks after hatching prior to death. The reasons, uncertain, we don't know. In one case, there's an exception, it was actually a catastrophic failure of the aquarium system itself. And the, the saddest thing about that particular um, skate was it was the one that had lasted the longest. It had survived 10 months. Um, prior to uh, prior to that incident, now it as far as sharks are concerned, it's fair to say that we take every egg that we encounter at the fish market, and we give each and every egg the fair and the same opportunity to develop. Many eggs are unfertilized or have been simply. Um, exposed to conditions which are against the natural developmental cycle. So for example, mechanical inference of damage or alternatively exposed to high temperatures. These things we don't know. But either way, and as you know, we collect egg, every single shark egg that we can get from the market, same as the skate eggs. And if we have a developing shark egg, it's fair to say once the embryo starts to develop, we have an 85 to 95% success rate, which is pretty high, considering where the eggs came from. Now, escape, we don't also, you know, we really don't know um, whether they're exposed to the same temperature variables, handling variables. And we also know the body structure of the escape is not as, uh, thermically um, supportive. So they're more like to be susceptible to cold, more so than a shark, due to their uh, dorsal, you know, dorsal ventrally flattened design. So with them, it's a work in progress. But what we're hoping is that through the new project of skate egg recovery through the fish shops, we will have an increased number of eggs from skates recovered and we can start to fine tune the parameters so that we can then have a successful skate release project to run alongside our shark release project. I truly believe it's possible. The difficulty is we're going to have to go through the same pain we did with sharks with skates to start with. But once we fine tuned it, with the support from the Multinational Aquarium and the curator Dan, who also has knowledge of thumbback rays, for example, you know, the, the prospect is very hopeful that we, you know, we can quite quickly find the right parameters and ultimately lead on to a release program. And ultimately, Kaylin will then have his work cut out because we'll also, you know, incorporate an adoption program in order to help support it. That's a good question, Charlie. Uh, uh. Um, it was just quickly to add to that um, regarding rays and skates. Is I remember reading somewhere, and admittedly this was through freshwater stingrays, um, so you know not exactly you know apples and oranges. Um, but they said that in aquarium situations they have problems with nitrate cycling. Apparently rays are just apparently just quite bad at, or those particular species of rays are just quite bad at um, like cycling the waste kind of out of the water. Um, so I thought my possibility going forward or something to look at i don't know no no absolutely. it's fresh water versus salt water no no it, you know to be fair anything and everything is worth exploring um from conversations with dan the curator of the, the national aquarium his experience with thornbacks in bristol aquarium before he moved to malta was that actually they used to have uh, wild caught male and females in the tanks so they they weren't recovering a case from dead, should we say. So these were uh, fully active males and females. And actually, when the pups hatched from the egg cases that were laid in the tank, 
once the um, the yolk had been consumed within the egg case, sorry, within the shark's stomach, they refused to eat. And actually, they had to hand feed with a variety of different food sources, the thornback skate pups. And after two, three or four days of hand feeding, then they started to become interested in feeding. And then eventually, many of them started to survive. So, you know, it's, it's a whole process. Now, as far as um, Ray's being <laughs> particularly dirty and skates being dirty, she's in the tank and nitrates. One thing to consider is that actually rays don't give birth to live young. Sorry, rays don't give birth by laying eggs. They only give birth to live young. But both rays and skates and sharks all deposit, you know, a relatively high number of nitrates in, in water. And that's why it's important that the aquarium systems are designed adequately in order to maintain the healthiest possible conditions. Our holding tank here um, in Salina has the protein skimmer as well as the mechanical filters in order to not only take out mechanical waste, but also uh, protein-based waste. And that's one of the reasons why the holding tank has been successful for the shark. However, because we don't have the, the, um, the right criteria, or we don't really understand the right criteria yet for skates, perhaps this explains why we've had a, a, a hit and miss um, success with their development. Even though we've had them hatching, we haven't had them surviving. And obviously what we want to do is that each and every egg that can develop has the best opportunity not only to develop and hatch, but also to ultimately release them from back in the sea. Oh, yeah. I mean, pretty answered all, all the steps there. Cheers for that. Pleasure. No problem. Anybody else has any questions? I mean, to be fair, oviparity and the development of skates and sharks is a fascinating subject. What I would recommend that you do is um, the PowerPoint presentation that I just kind of put, you know, put for this evening. At the end of it, there is a sequence of references. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Ross, and Ross is going to upload it onto the website under the open session. And at the very end, there's a sequence of references. Now, within the references, there are I think five or six papers, scientific papers, looking specifically at the developmental process of skates um, and sharks within the Mediterranean specifically, as well as the seven stages of um, development for Sidrinus stellaris, the nurse hound, which also incorporates data for uh, Sidrinus canicula. And for any other interns listening, don't forget I'm going to test you on your certified species of shark scientific Latin name probably during one of our next dissection sessions. Um, side note. Uh, but feel free to actually um, look at the references on the end of the PowerPoint because they are free um, journals, journal posts, uh, free, you know, free items that can be downloaded. So take them, save them, read them. They are quite fascinating. And some of the images that I used for tonight were actually from there. Yes, Pam. I just want to say thank you for tonight's talk. It was very interesting. And to say that the more awareness we get around the island, the more we're finding out. I've been talking to a lot of the students at school, primary school, uh, along with all the interns that are listening in tonight. And from those children, we're getting sightings. And they may not be shark's eggs yet, but they are finding things on the beach, which is a great, great start. So the awareness is, is coming around. So thank you very much. I mean, the other thing on top of that, Pam, and thank you for the comment, is that you know most of the most of the people, if not all, almost, um, this evening are actually interns or directly related to the organization. You know. You've been using Instagram, you've been using Facebook, you've been using YouTube to create greater awareness through postings. The Miko and side things, which Jacopo is, is in charge of, um, is also a great place to direct people to for egg case items. 